welcome to the Global Space Nepal on um, strategies to promote sustainable tourism in Nepal. And we have a, as a guest, uh, Binod Magar from Nepal, who will speak about this. Uh, my name is Maya Lo. I'm from the Afro Asian Institute. I'm the educational manager here. And the Afro Asian Institute is an uh, NGO and a platform for encounter between um, and dialogue also between cultures and religions. And we also do uh, environmental and like we deal also with the environmental and development issues. So um, the sustainable development goals are, for example, also um, a major um, theme of our educational program. Mr. Maga, and he was born in Kathmandu and also raised there. And he did his bachelor in tourism there. And then he also worked for five years in this sector in a travel company. And then he came to Salzburg to study um, innovation and management in tourism at the University for Applied Sciences in Salzburg. And uh, yeah, he came in 2018. And he, um, like, nearly graduated because he uh, gave in his um, master thesis recently. Congratulations also. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, so he will be done very soon with um, his master. Um, his master thesis was dealing with uh, destination images um, that European travelers have on Nepal. And yeah, I'm very glad that um, you will present now this topic, sustainability and tourism in Nepal. And yeah, I give you the word and I wish everybody a nice presentation and discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Maya. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome uh, to my presentation. Thank you for joining me today. So I hope everyone is doing well uh, in a good health and keeping safe from COVID in this difficult time, more importantly, with a positive mindset, because that's what we need most now. And I would also like to thank uh, Afro Asian Institute Salzburg for organizing this event and inviting me. And also I would like to thank my professor, Eva Brucker, head of the department for arranging, connecting me to Afro Institute of Salzburg and giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, so, before I begin this, yeah, I would just like to tell everyone, yeah, just let's have a positive mindset in this difficult time and everything will be better soon. Uh, I would like to start with this Buddhist quote that nothing is permanent and this shall pass soon. So uh, let's start. Yeah, for today's uh, topic, I have uh, made us some small outline that what we are talking about. So I'll be introducing you a bit about Nepal, like giving you a short background about what a country Nepal is, like some uh, geographical, cultural things that Nepal has. And then I will talk about the sustainability practices around tourism that has been taking place in Nepal. And then we'll, we'll go a bit on the challenges. What are the challenges that Nepal is facing? And a discussion session where we can also talk what can we do further in this area? So that is going to be the today's uh, discussion points. Okay, let's uh, begin with a short introduction about Nepal. Yeah, Nepal is a country which has uh, a long uh, history. Uh, we, we have like uh, around 2000 years of history and it is always a sovereign and independent country. Uh, before Nepal used to be a monarchical system ruled by monarchy by the kings and it was only the Hindu country in the world until 2008. Uh, after that, Nepal got uh, uh, the uh, Federal Republic uh, we don't have king anymore, and it is ruled by the multi-party system. Uh, currently, the ruling party in Nepal is uh, the leftist party. Uh, it has got the majority in the parliament. The Maoist and the Unified National Communist Party of Nepal has become one. Sorry. Yeah, and it's the ruling party. And Nepal is also the member of UNO since uh, 14 December 1955. Uh, we also applied it a bit earlier in 1949, but in 1955, we got uh, the membership. And Nepal has this diplomatic relationship with uh, countries Britain in 1816, which is quite early, for sure, because there is uh, another history between Nepal and Britain while uh, British East India Company was ruling in India. Uh, we had uh, a bit of face-off and then started like that. But since then, we have like a friendly relationship. 
And then we have also got the diplomatic relationship with the uh, other powers, world powers like the US, France, China, Japan. And with Austria, we had it in 1959, Germany in 1965. So like Nepal could uh, maintain a friendly relationship, diplomatic relationship with all these countries. Yeah, like Nepal, it is a small country which also has to do that. <laughs> and it has been able to do that since very early. So, uh, Talking about the geography of Nepal, it, is, it has the area of 147,516 square kilometer. It is roughly the size of Austria. Uh, I guess it's a little bit bigger. And uh, it's in a 880 kilometer length, which goes east-west. And its breadth is 150 in the lowest point, which is in the central part, and 250 kilometer wide in the, in the western part, the maximum area. And with the size, it's only a 0.3% of Asia and 0.03% in the world. But within its small ma uh, land mass, it still has got really diverse ecosystem and culture and so many things. Uh, talking about altitude, because Nepal, of course, we have got the highest mountain in the world, uh, Mount Everest, which goes 8,848 meter above the sea level. And the lowest point in Nepal is in the eastern, southeastern part, which is close to Indian border and it is roughly 60 meters. So you can imagine that uh, within the just mere uh, distance of 200 kilometers, uh, Nepal goes from 60 meters to 8,848 meters. That makes Nepal one of the steepest country in the world. And also because of this altitude variation, we have got very diverse uh, uh, flora and fauna and the climatic conditions. Like we have three zones, like uh, the lower plains, which is hot and humid, and the mid hills, which have temperate climate, and of course, of course, the mountains they have uh, alpine climate. Uh, with these three reasons, so uh, let's make it a bit interesting. Uh, just to make uh, you all participate in this one, I'm just asking a rough question. This is about this mountain. Uh, if anyone can name this mountain, okay, I just end the polling here now, and I so the result, and it shows. Most of the people have voted uh, Manaslu. <laughs> and the right answer here is, it's the last option, Dhaulagiri. <laughs> yeah, and definitely 25% people have uh, chosen right. And it is the seventh highest mountain in the world. And this picture, I just took it in 2012 uh, from the Muktinath, uh, from Muktinath, yes. And yeah, I also chose this picture especially because this is the mountain that was first climbed by by an Austrian climber. Yeah, he is uh, Mr. Kurt Dimberger in 1960. He's also the person uh, who climbed the two mountains for the first time, like including Dhaulagiri in 1960 and the Broad Peak in 1957. So this mountain has also the connection with Austria. <laughs> Interesting. So I just want to move further uh, in the geography. So Nepal also has like a really huge portion of its land protected. Uh, it's roughly 23.39% of its total land mass, which is a protected area now. Uh, so this is like a very big part of uh, tourism in Nepal. Yeah, now I just want to go a bit in the culture. So Nepal is like a very uh, uh, interesting country. It's a, it's a melting point, melting pot for the Aryan, Hindu, and the Buddhist culture. So Nepal has more than 80% of Hindus, 10% of Buddhists, and also it has all other religions, which all live in a very peaceful harmony. We have all Muslims, Christians, Jains, and many other religion. And beside that, we have more than 120 ethnic groups living in this, such a small country. And I myself belong to one of the ethnic group, Magar, which originally comes from the western part of Nepal. I actually, below this mountain of this Thaulagiri and Annapurna, which I just showed you before. And we have a festival around the year. And I also posted this picture here, which is me, myself, and my aunt, which is the festival of Tihar, which we just celebrated yesterday. So it is also a Hindu festival, which is celebrated between like brothers and sisters and for praying for the long life of each other. So like we have festivals, such festivals like in every month, at least one or two, like some bigger or smaller. And religion is really a part of life. Like people have like uh, different uh, rituals and traditions taking place from birth till the death. So it's like 
everything is associated with the religion. So in that sense, Nepal is like rich in culture and tradition and which people would love uh, following and practicing until today's date. So that was a bit about the culture and history about Nepal. So I just want to also show you, a, before moving to the tourism part of Nepal, I just want to show you a small video clip, which is in the, about the tourism. Uh, actually, I just also wanted to show this uh, video particularly because it has uh, a bit of story behind it. Uh, it was uh, produced in in uh, 2015, actually immediately after this earthquake uh, in 2015, April 25. And then it was produced uh, by the support of UK Aid and the local uh, uh, NGO of uh, Samat and MTP uh, for giving a message to the people out there in the world who wanted to come to Nepal, because uh, at the time when the earthquake happened, so everything was shut down and the tourism was like gone to completely shut down. So for that reason, we wanted to bring, give a message that uh, Nepal is uh, open for the tourism and uh, we would want more tourists than ever at that time after the earthquake, because earthquake happened in during the tourist season, high tourist season, which is in, in April. And then we wanted like the next season in October, uh, which is the next season that people would be willing to come back to Nepal so that they could uh, contribute to the economy again. So that was the reason purpose that uh, this, uh, this video was produced. And I was also uh, like working in the, in the logistic team uh, while producing this video. So I thought this was a bit meaningful that we did something for, for the uh, promotion of tourism in Nepal. So I just want to show you a bit uh, small figures uh, about, about the tourism in Nepal. So last year in 2019, we had uh, uh, 1 million, approximately 200,000 tourists in 2019. And in 2020, this year, uh, in the last 10 months, like the figures from January to October, we had around 200,000, 218,000. It is still debatable, like some experts say, because this is the number that might be including some people like the Nepalese Anaran, who are also like counted as a foreigner. So this number cannot be like a very uh, realistic because as we see in 2020, like after this COVID situation, because in the March, uh, the country was gone to the lockdown and because that is the high tourist season and then there were very few people in the, in the, in, in the country. That's why this number still looks a bit high for according to some experts. And we have like average stay in Nepal of around 2.6 days uh, in 2018. And average spending was to that 44 US dollar per day in 2018, like which was even $10 less than the year in 2017. And the total foreign currency earning uh, in 2018 was US dollar 597 million, which is a big uh, contribution for the economy of Nepal. And also it employed uh, roughly half a million people in the industry, directly and indirectly. So you can also see in the figure that the, even the, for, the tourists coming to Nepal, the most of the people, they are from the neighboring countries, uh, India and China. Uh, the biggest number after, after India and China comes from USA, UK, and like uh, in, in, in Europe, mostly they are from UK, uh, Germany, France, the top most uh, tourist, tourist generating countries. And here I would like to also go a bit connected with the protected areas and tourism because most of the people that travel to Nepal, they would visit in these protected areas like Everest region, Annapurna region, and of course, Chito National Park. So these protected areas have been the, the backbone of the tourism of the country since, since the beginning of the tourism. Uh, like just the figure says, in 2018 alone, uh, in Everest region, we have 57,000 trekkers. And like in 2019, uh, the number 644 is only the number of people who reached on the Everest on the top. But there were many people who uh, uh, couldn't make it. So the number would be still bigger who were climbing on the mountain. And similarly, the, the, the important thing we have to see here is uh, the the contribution of the Everest in the economy of the country, like a single permit, uh, a climbing permit of Everest cost 11,000 US dollar per person, and which is a big number. So like uh, if you count uh, the total number per person with the 
amount, then it's definitely going to be a very big contribution. Like the total contribution of US alone in the on the average permit is 4.5 US dollar million. Yeah, and similarly, the Annapurna region is also the, the another area which receives the highest uh, tourists. And, and Chito National Park, definitely the lower part of the Nepal, where we have got the uh, diverse flora and fauna, including like uh, Royal Bengal tigers, one horned rhino, yeah, and also very vast species of birds. So what I want to tell you here is like the Nepal and tourism, they are very connected with the protected areas. I have a question concerning yes. the climbing permit. What is included in this permit? Uh, it's just that you are supposed to climb the mountain. You have the, uh, the you are allowed to climb the mountain. It's there's nothing included. Uh, it's just like a entrance fee to the mountain. The rest of like all the things that you need to eat in and like equipment, everything, rest of the thing will be like set. It might cost from twenty thousand US dollars to even higher, depending upon the qualities of the service that you're using from the company. And the luxurious uh, luxurious trip now in Everest can even go uh, above 50, 60,000 US dollars per person for climbing the whole thing because it takes a couple of months, a month at least, to like do rotation going to the, from the base camp to the camp two, camp three, coming back, acclimatizing. So the cost is really high uh, for climbing the Everest. Yeah, so let's uh, come to the sustainability. That's the main uh, area that we were talking about. Well, sustainability doesn't require any definition now, I guess, because it is already so engraved in our, in our yeah, daily life now. So we, we are not able to escape from this because it, we can, it's really evident now in our, in our uh, environment, also in the weather pattern that we see nowadays. Uh, there has been uh, really big uh, events and incidents uh, around the world, uh, which is associated with the climate change, like the big wildfires that has been in Australia or, or in the South America, in the USA. I mean, everything is are very connected with the world uh, global temp climate change and temperature rise. And the concept has emerged since 1980s. And after that, there has been enough numerous uh, summit and conferences that held uh, and talking about the issues of sustainability. Uh, I just don't want to go into each of them. I just want to come directly to the, the last summit that happened in 2015, which is Paris Agreement, because the summit is regarded as one of the, one of the milestone because it has uh, brought out something really important and it has uh, shown a very firm and a strong commitment from the leaders around the world to fight against the climate change. Uh, just to make it very uh, simple, like the, the thing that came out from this Paris Agreement in 2015 was very simple and clear that we want to keep the uh, global temperature rise below two degrees within this century. Uh, and we have already uh, completed to that. I mean, we are almost near to complete 2020, which is like one fifth of the 21st century, and we have more like 80 years. And within this period, uh, we don't want our temperatures to rise like at least two degree. We should limit it below two degree, and that is that was the pr primary goal. And also the the another important thing that came out was the commitment from the nations around the world, and it came as a world called as NDC, which is National Determined Contribution. So each country has got their own. Uh, prioritized, uh, uh, yeah, uh, approach to curb this uh, climate, uh, global temperature change. So they can prioritize their actions, and then they can uh, get the thing done uh, to meet the certain goal that each country has got uh, against the fight of this climate change. Yeah, and yeah, just connecting this with Nepal. Nepal is also as a member of uh, UNO and also fighting against this climate change. Nepal also has the place uh, to uh, reduce the, the global temperature rise. And as a Nepal, uh, since Nepal is not already a industrialized country, the, the emission of CO2 from Nepal historically has not been so high. Uh, so it's uh, because of that reason also like Nepal, the allowance that Nepal has got uh, to 
until 2030 or during this century is not, Nepal has still got some chances, it can work on the industrialization or something. But so far it has not been taking place. And the place of Nepal has been consistent in the three areas like the capability. Uh, it is like the allowance that Nepal can uh, get uh, while producing the CO, producing the certain limit of CO2. And since it is not industrialized and the emission has been low, so it is, yeah, I mean, uh, it is consistent with that target. Yeah, and so like, why is it more critical for Nepal? When we talk about sustainability, definitely this question arises immediately. And here I just wanted to show you a, a news article. This is very recently, it is uh, just last week, uh, a news came into the National Daily, Nepali Times. And there has been uh, news like in just a headline, like in just two years, Nepal has become snowless. And here you can see the picture of uh, a mountain, which is in the Western part of uh, Nepal. Uh, this mountain is called Mount Saipal, Western part, very close to the Indian border. And the picture at the first, you can see, this is of October, 2008. And the second picture here is 2018, like after a decade. And the third picture is the recent one, like from the October, 2020. You can easily see the difference between the, the amount of snow in the mountain there. So it has like very uh, significantly decreased. And of course, like it is not only in that one particular mountain, it, it is happening around like in many mountains in the Himalayas. So, and this is like really a huge issue now, like the melting of the snow uh, in the Himalayas. And yeah, the problem is definitely connected with this climate change and the temperature rise as Nepal is all situated in like between these two highly industrialized country, India and China, which is uh, yeah, producing a really huge amount of CO2 emission that has direct impact into the mountains like this. And one more thing that I want to uh, stress here is like the mountains, the Himalayas, they have really uh, been like a backbone for, for the water resources for many countries, including Nepal, India, uh, Bhutan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Myanmar, China, like the countries around these Himalayas, they are highly re uh, relying on the, on the water from the Himalayas because directly or indirectly for drinking, for irrigation, for hydroelectricity and various other purposes, this mountain has been like supporting. Uh, like the, the report from Isimod, uh, the, uh, the organization that works for the mountain development and conservation, uh, that says that nearly 1.9 billion people uh, rely on the water from, from the Himalayas, and that is a huge population. And also the, the report has been saying that if the global climate change is not going to be curved down uh, by the end of the century, uh, like one third of the Himalayas snow can it disappear. So, I mean, the problem is uh, really critical and we, we need to it very seriously. Yeah, so that is the uh, one point that I want to show it here. Yeah, now we just come to Nepal. Like what has Nepal been doing uh, when we talk about this uh, sustainability and the mountain conservation? Actually, Nepal had really a good start very early in 1970s. It was the time when Nepal first uh, uh, devised its uh, Conservation Act. Uh, it was started by King, King Mahendra, and he in his, in his tenure started the, the Nepal National Nature Conservation Act and policy. And in 1973, the first national park of Nepal, Chito National Park was established. Uh, this is somewhere uh, here you can see in the uh, figure, which is in the central part of Nepal, into the southern plain, close to the Indian border. So this was the first national park. And this is the part that I was talking about where we have got this uh, diverse flora and fauna and the wild, sorry, the wild animals like uh, mm, Royal Bengal tiger, one-horned rhino, and various species of bird. Actually, we have like 68 species of mammals in this national park and like 544 species of birds, which is really a big number. I mean, it is really good place for, for bird watching and everything. 
and the Sagarmatha National Park, or the, the Sagarmatha is the Nepalese name for Everest. So the Everest National Park was also established in 1976. And Chitwan and Sagarmatha, these two national parks are also listed under the UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the, the, the yeah, flora, fauna, and also the culture and mountains that is uh, there in, sorry. Yeah, similarly, the another one is Anapuna Conservation Area that I would like to stress because it is one of the biggest one. Here you can see in the western part of Nepal, covers nearly 7,629 square kilometer. And it has done a really phenomenal job for the conservation of the of the, the area. And yeah, so also it is very crucial for the tourism industry of Nepal. Uh, and uh, not to miss that the conservation thing, sorry, is still like going on. See, we also added two more. Uh, conservation area in 2010. It's Gauri Sankar Conservation Area in Apinampa. The Apinampa is in the in the western part of Nepal, yeah, uh, close to the Indian border. And Gauri Sankar is also uh, close to the Everest region. Yes. So, uh, and the actions that uh, has been taken for the sustainability. First of all, I just wanted to say you, uh, there are basically like the. I have uh, outlined four different players. They are government, uh, of course, because they are the one who devise the national policy and act and implement, make rules and regulation. So they are very uh, come at the first place. And the second are the community level. I mean, the local people who are living into that area, into the national park, in the buffer zone, or close to that area. They are, they are the backbone because they are the one who are responsible to act and do the things that, that help for the conservation of the place. And similarly, the private businesses, like we are talking about uh, tour companies, the trekking companies, who, which organize the, these expeditions, uh, trekking, mountaineering, and everything, and also the hotels and airlines that operate in Nepal. So they all are also are the part of this uh, sustainability because their actions and roles plays a huge uh, difference uh, for making a country for the destination more sustainable. And definitely not to miss are the travelers because the travelers are the one like uh, who can uh, be more significant on the way how they take part in, the, in, the, in traveling the country, how they travel the country, like being responsible traveler and not creating more waste and respecting the culture, economy and the environment they will help for the sustainable, sustainable tourism in the country. So these are the four players that I would like to share. Uh, yes, further I, I now want to talk about the actions and initiatives. So what are the things that has been done so far? Uh, this is talking about the Annapurna conservation area, the largest one in Nepal. And this is the one conservation area that has been doing really good job uh, into the area of tourism and conservation, balancing the both thing very well, and also with the very good participation from the community level, from the people. Basically, the Onopuna Conservation Area, uh, uh, it was formed in uh, 1986, but the conservation that I'm writing here, 1992, is the community that started working uh, for this conservation area. So it is completely done from the, there is organization, of course, uh, this, uh, Annapurna Conservation Area Project, uh, which is under the uh, government, government of Nepal. Uh, but they are employing the local people for, for doing this, all the activities. Like, for example, there has been talked about previously, people used to rely highly on the firewoods for, like, for their daily needs, like for cooking, for many other things. But now, like, when, people, when the awareness is created uh, among the people, like how that they, they should not uh, cut down the trees, they should be protecting it, and not only for the environment, but also for the tourism, because once they start depleting the environment, it does not look good, and, and that makes a very huge difference. So after this conservation area project started, people stopped doing that, I mean, to very less extent, and there were like other trainings given to the people uh, like generating income, like for example, the homestays or, or establishing a new laws for the tourists. Or also there was the last uh, thing that was talking about this tea plantation program. Like the tea plantation was going on in one of the area there. 
where people could get employment and also get on money. So it's like when the community work together uh, for the conservation of the area, they can also get benefit, like which is like from the either from the tourism or doing some other uh, uh, thing like the farming uh, or like the team plantation, something like that. So this is the one example that has been uh, like a leading example for people and for other conservation area in the whole Nepal. I mean, there are so many activities that they have done. Maybe I could, I cannot uh, uh, present you well in the in, in the in that short video. But basically, this this is the idea of involving the people for which is also called as the integrated approach uh, of the people uh, for the development uh, for the conservation and for the development, which has been uh, very successful in Nepal in 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 Annapurna region. So that is one thing. Uh, the next thing I want to talk is about the homestay. The homestay concept, uh, the place called Sirubari, which is also uh, in the lower foothills of Annapurna. Uh, it's in the Sangha district. It is a small village and it started the idea of uh, being, doing this homestay, which means uh, any people, any guests, especially tourists, uh, they are invited into the home the, of the local people. They will stay with the family, eat with the family, they cook, and like it, ha it is a really authentic experience that they can experience the local life of the people. It's not like the tourists are staying in the, in a in a lodge or in a hotel, but they are living with the family. And this concept was introduced in 1997. It was actually started by uh, an individual uh, from the village who was a retired army. Uh, I think his name is Rudraman Guru, and he developed this idea of like creating his own home as a as a place for homestay where he would be the host and invite the guest. And then for that, they would, uh, the guest would pay some uh, amount of money, which is like extra income for the family. And especially the good thing about is this idea is that the, the people who went there, they were really happy. They were more satisfied than like, than being in any other places uh, like in the lodges or in the hotel, because they are very commercial. They just go there, they eat, they sleep, but they don't get an experience. But in this case here is like they are living in a typical Nepalese family house and then they can see like how the food here is being cooked and they can also visit their farm where they are working in the field, participate in that, do the hiking around the place. And also this place is really beautiful. From there you could also see the mountain views of Annapurna, Dhaulagiri. And so it was a really very good concept that started. And slowly this concept was followed by many other places as well around Nepal. Like the Ghale Gaon, uh, this is another place which is also uh, in, the, in, in the western part in the, around the Annapurna region. So this village also uh, followed the concept from Sirubari. They learned the best practices and also implemented that in their village and which was also very successful. And, and this idea was actually also very popular for the, for the domestic travelers as well. Like so many people now from Kathmandu or around Nepal, they try, they want to go to these places, uh, Sirubari and Khalegao, and to get that experience. And since this is not really an expensive form of tourist activities, people enjoy it. They don't spend much money. On the other hand, the local people, they directly get the income. There is no any kind of like uh, uh, a middleman or something. So this, is, this works perfect. And why I say this is a very good example for sustainable tourism is because here you can see that there is no any uh, separate institution or there is no any uh, hotel like some establishment where you need to uh, like uh, prepare something separate for, for a guest, like uh, making a hotel or creating uh, separate amenities for their stay. Here it's like there is already a house which are local people own and you just go there and use one of their rooms to stay for a night and eat the same food like what the what the people are eating there and this makes like you are using the least amount of resources to create that experience and i i think this is this cannot be uh compared to any other uh like commercial tourist experiences that you get into the hotel or lodges so it is like a perfect win-win situation for everyone the locals enjoy the locals have their part of uh, income the tourists they are enjoying I mean, they love, love the experience. And also at the end, there is no any negative uh, impact in the environment or something like that. So it's like a very good example of how uh, uh, it can be 
contributing to the sustainable tourism. Yeah, and uh, thirdly, uh, I also want to talk about SPCC, it's the Sagramata Pollution Control Committee, which is in the Everest region. And this is the organization that uh, looks after the, uh, like the waste management, especially in, in the Everest region. Uh, maybe I just can show you a bit of uh, uh, something that that, had, that, that, that the SP, SPCC has been doing. Uh, and it is basically helping to clean, make the environment clean in the Everest region because everybody is aware now that in Everest, there are thousands of uh, uh, trekkers and also the mountaineers going to climb the mountains every year. And that, that uh, leaves a huge amount of uh, waste uh, uh, there. And all that waste needs to be uh, very properly handled. And for, that is the work that uh, SPCC has been doing there. Uh, this is the report that I have taken uh, from the SPCC uh, re annual report. And they have uh, the work that they have done is like they, uh, with the garbage beans, they have the collection centers, they have the waste facilities uh, to like, uh, and also the burning chambers and the toilets, which is the, one of the most uh, important thing in the Everest region. So all of those things have been uh, taken care of by SPCC. Uh, I know for sure Professor Luger, who is here in, with us in the room, and he with his Eco Himal, it has been also supporting the, the work of this waste management and everything in the Everest region. Uh, so this is uh, also one really good initiation that the thing that has been done in Everest region uh, for the sustainable tourism, because when you are protecting your environment and like managing the waste and everything, uh, it definitely uh, makes your, the place better and it will last longer. If you just don't uh, care about the, uh, all those things, then it will pile up and at a certain point of time, it will be like no longer a beautiful place. Yeah, so these are the work. Uh, these are some uh, figures uh, that the uh, SPCC has uh, made in its reports. So you can see the huge amount of waste has been has been taken out uh, from from the Everest region, like especially the 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 uh, non biodegradable things, uh, which are like the cans, the bottles, the beer bot uh, bottles, or everything like that. I mean, in Everest region, because it's cold and like foods are not grown there, everything has to be taken from the cities like Kathmandu, and therefore like the the waste that is created out of the uh, tourism is very huge because most of the thing needs to be uh, keep on, kept uh, frozen for a long time so that it, uh, it does not go waste. So in that sense, uh, like all the aluminium things, the metal, all of these are collected there and that, that creates a huge amount of uh, thing there. And this organization has been like working to bring those things back from the mountains, uh, bring it to the lower places or even send it back to the Kathmandu and see this where it can be properly handled with that by doing some recycling things, uh, something like that. Uh, yes, this was something about SPCC. And uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if because uh, the video is not really working, uh, so otherwise I just wanted to show a small clip that is, which is about, about the, clean energy technology. I mean, this is the thing that has been uh, uh, slowly practiced also in, I mean, in Everest region, uh, it is a bigger, bigger plan that is going to happen, which is uh, to convert the human feces into the, into the gas, like convert into the methane gas and then use it for the cooking or for any other purposes. Because, you know, in, in, the, in the climbing process of a mountain, the Everest Base Camp and in, in, in these places where during the high season when there are so many of climbers and trekkers staying there for a long time and the, and the things that they collected from there uh, are brought down into somewhere and those things could be further uh, using the technology of this biogas could be converted into the energy. And so this is the process that has been uh, trying to do. Uh, and this one is just one example, but in Nepal previously also, uh, the biogas using the cow dung for converting into the energy has been practiced widely, especially in the villages. 
So this could be an, another alternative uh, for a country like Nepal, which can uh, uh, very easily use and also like uh, make the environment more cleaner at the same time have like uh, benefit from, 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 from the West. Just not let them go and then make the environment dirty, but uh, do the other way around just to use that waste and make it convert it into the energy so that that energy can further help people and also even earn some money. So maybe I'll just don't go into the video because uh, yeah, it, it may not look proper. So I just talk about it. Uh, and the next one is like accommodations. Uh, this is not happening in a very large scale, but still like now many uh, hotels or resorts, they are being open now. They are uh, practicing this, uh, um, eco-friendly uh, uh, concept. Uh, like for example, they are uh, using this, uh, har they are harvesting the rainwater and coll collecting the rainwater for various purposes like cleaning and everything. And they are also having their own farm from where they can produce their own uh, um, bio vegetable products, which they are, they are like uh, providing for their guests who are staying in, their, in the place. And also like the energy, like what they need for their hotel, they are producing it from the solar energy uh, and also re reducing the amount of, uh, amount of the, uh, the missing machinery items, especially like the air cooling system, like many uh, resorts now are avoiding this thing because they are not very environment friendly. So they are making the, the natural uh, conditioning into the room. They are building the room in such a way, like using the natural products, like the wood and the mud, which has like a natural conditioning. So that makes it uh, uh, cool during the, during the summer and also are warmer in the winter. So such practices are also being done from the side of the accommodations, which is also uh, contributing for the better tourism. Uh, and similarly, like the tour agencies, like the tour companies that are, uh, that are organizing these trips, the trekking, all those things in Nepal, they are also uh, following, practicing, trying to practice the sustainable things into their, into their uh, uh, operations. Like for example, they would uh, uh, hire the local people who are from the region so that they can give employment to those people, uh, which is like also a sustainable part so that the people from the area will be more benefited. And also because they also have more knowledge and skills and idea about their place compared to the person who is from the other region. So in that case, they can also give better uh, information and uh, experiences to the guest. In the meantime, they will be also benefited from the, uh, from, the, from the employment. So that is what the tour agencies are doing. Uh, and sorry. And lastly, I just want to talk a bit about the airlines. Uh, there, is a, there was a news uh, that the, one of the airlines, which is AT Airlines, becomes first Nepal's carbon neutral airline. So basically the airlines industry are also aware about the, the carbon emission and they're also trying to reduce their uh, CO2 emission. And what, for this process, one of the airlines, uh, Eti, uh, which has also the sister airline called Tara, which flies more to the remote places also in the Everest region. So this, this airline company, they are also trying to reduce their CO2 emission and which they were already uh, successful doing like in 2019, uh, sorry, in 18, they, they reduced uh, the CO2 emission, emission by 20% uh, per flight kilometer and also by 12% uh, per passenger, like which is a great job. So to summarize the whole thing, like every different organization, whether be it uh, from the private businesses, like the hotel, resort, airlines, uh, tour companies, they are doing something from their uh, from their side, which can contribute for the tourism and also for the sustainability. Uh, and similarly, from the government side, uh, we talked before, uh, maybe there has not been a very bigger step or significant, but something that had started earlier that is still like uh, giving some good, better results. But if, if there would be a very proactive and uh, determination from the government side, and also all the parties would come together and work, then maybe the result would be far much uh, better. Uh, okay, so 
that was about the actions and things that has been done. Uh, so men, let's uh, talk more about the challenges. So we have done something, yes, but still there are much more to be done because uh, yeah, there are always a place for making better. Even if you are always good, there is even always a uh, chance to do much more better. So when we talk about the challenges, uh, the waste management, it definitely comes as one of the uh, most uh, important issue. One, we just talked about the SPCC, the Everest region, which is doing something, but that is not enough uh, because there are still, uh, not only in Everest region, there are so many other air trekking areas where, are, where the problem is uh, same there. Everest has a bit bigger because it is the world's highest mountain and the number of people coming there is always higher. And yeah, therefore the waste produced there is also higher. And yes, the work is being done, but uh, we might even need to scale it in a, in a bigger way. So waste management is one of the issues. And the similarly, the energy. Uh, when we talk about the energy, uh, it's like the energy that uh, would be required for the uh, losses in the mountains for like lightning or cooking, or even the transportation, like we, we talked about the airlines, like the thing that we are transporting people and the tourists. So energy is also one of the biggest concern for Nepal. Uh, because uh, Nepal has, uh, uh, is not like a co country that generates its own energy completely. Uh, it has to export. Uh, the one thing that Nepal is uh, producing is like the hydroelectricity and that is which Nepal has got a very big potential. Uh, like the uh, reports says that Nepal's potential to produce hydroelectricity is very high. Like even it goes, uh, the, la the viable economical uh, uh, figure for Nepal to produce is around 40,000 megawatt, which is very big. And if Nepal could produce uh, those hydroelectricity, then like the problem for the energy would be highly solved. And because uh, energy is very associated also with the environment, because when we talked about the Anupur conservation area and people's using the firewood as their as their uh, as the thing for for their yeah like cooking and for other various purposes or heating and lightning. So if we don't uh, solve the problem of energy in the remote areas, especially in the mountain, uh, it could lead to the depletion of environment. So therefore energy is very closely connected with the, with the uh, sustainability. Uh, for that, the only way Nepal could uh, move in the direction is uh, creating, generating more hydroelectricity in the future and could solve the energy problem. Uh, and the unequal distribution of wealth. Uh, so this is this has to do with the uh, with the tourism. Like in in the different region of Nepal, the tourism is like uh, uh, distributed. Like some places have higher tourist uh, uh, traveling there, and some places has flew. Even in in the area of one particular region, we talk about the Everest region. In the Everest region also, like there are, there will be some few places which has, has more economic benefit from the tourism compared to the other area in the same region. So this also has, this is also the problem because uh, let's say for example, the place Lukla where, where every tourist pass while going to the trek, that place has got more chances to receive more guests compared to any other places which are away from the main trail. So in that case, uh, people will be getting uh, unequal amount of uh, yeah benefit from the tourism, and that can also lead to to the uh, uh, participation from the people in a different scale. Like the, those people who, are, who, are, who are get more benefit from the tourism would be uh, is likely to take part in the in the in the activities which are more sustainable more than the people who have got less chances. So that, that will make a difference between those people. Uh, so therefore, this is also one challenge that, uh, that, that, might, that the tourism industry might face. 
when we want to work in the area of sustainable tourism. Uh, the next one uh, is the unplanned development. When, when I say the unplanned development, like the development things that has been happening um, more in the in the remote areas, like would be the road construction or any kind of other development. So when such things happen uh, without any uh, proper research or seeing the consequences related to the environment and also the socio cultural aspect, then that is also going to be a problem in the future for the sustainable tourism in Nepal. Uh, we can see uh, that the the road construction in in the Annapurna region has also led to uh, like lower number of tourists because once it used to be a, a trekking program which would last for three to four weeks now has been shortened to uh, you could also even uh, finish that uh, trek in a, in a week or 10 days because there is a transportation which has reached to a remote village. So that makes, uh, of course, that has pros and cons that uh, people will get uh, the supply easily. People have got access to different things, but that has also got one negative uh, environmental consequences, like uh, bringing the more pollution. And also uh, from the tourism perspective, like... Uh, uh, the trekkers would not be very interested to the place which are already crowded with uh, uh, motor vehicles or which is not much more serene or beautiful like before. So that is also the one challenge. Uh, and the one last thing that I have mentioned here is the topographical condition of Nepal. Because as we know, as it's a very mountainous country and has got like very difficult terrain. So that makes it difficult to... Uh, for anything that you want to do it there, like if you want to uh, do any development work, like the construction thing, or even build a lodge, uh, it is difficult to do it there because of uh, uh, the high altitude, the cold climate. Yeah, and because of that challenges, uh, the thing that we want to bring it there, for example, uh, there, there are so many remote places which are still not connected with the, the main hydroelectric electricity grid because it has got this challenge of this topographical situation. So when the development uh, thing has to be taken into those places, uh, this challenge was always there. Uh, Nepal would require a bit of uh, technology which are more sophisticated and which can work in also in this difficult uh, topography and in the climatic condition, that would be also the one challenge. Uh, for the sustainability in tourism in Nepal. Okay, so I am uh, close to, uh, near to the end. So at the end, I have, uh, so as I am not really an expert uh, from the sustainability or tourism, uh, as you know, like I am a student and I'm learning, but I'm enthusiastic, but from my point of view and as a, as a learner and as a, from my experience and my observation, uh, what I have thought, what I, have, I can see is that uh, the way that we can do further is uh, related with that the, all these players that we talked before come together and work together. And uh, here I have not mentioned the fourth player, which is travelers, and which is definitely important. Uh, but I have just uh, given the three people here. It's like the business stakeholders, the private, from the tourism or the, any other businesses and the community and the government. So if these three people, three group who have, who have got a, their own uh, interest, if they have, have the common understanding of how the tourism should be developed and the common understanding and agreement on developing Nepal as a sustainable destination, then definitely the, we, we have like a better future. So because there needs to be uh, interest and motivation from the side of the community people, because they are the person who will at the end act and the government are the person who needs to have the vision and leadership. They, they need to show to the uh, community or the, or the business people or the, in general to the public, like how could we go into the path of sustainable tourism? Like they are the person who creates the policies and regulations. So they, they need to be proactive. And similarly, the business and the stakeholders who are like the support system because they can they are they can be the middle thing. They would act as a breeze by uh, 
by sharing their resources or by bringing the businesses into the to the community, like the bringing the tourists uh, or also providing the technology. So when these three uh, 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 stakeholders come together and then they share this knowledge and skill, the funding and technology, then I can see that the, the tourism and the sustainability can be, can be combined and uh, uh, worked for the bringing the positive change. And I also like to give this analogy of head, heart and hand. Uh, this, this works in every, in everywhere, basically. So this is what I mean to say from this is like, if we have the head, if we know what and why is sustainable tourism important, if we have that understanding, and if we have the motivation to do that, if we are committed, if we have interest, and if we also have the skills and tools, for example, how to work knowledge in the community level or, or from the managerial level, if we have all these three things, then the next, uh, yeah, then the sustainable tourism is not really far and difficult to achieve. So that is the one uh, suggestions uh, from my personal side uh, to work for the sustainable tourism development of Nepal. Uh, yes, basically uh, this is uh, near to the end of my presentation. Further, we can talk, we can discuss. Uh, if you have any opinions or suggestions around these issues, please feel free and yeah. That's from my side. I hope it was interesting for you. Yes, thank you very much, Pinot, for your presentation and your <laughs> input. And yeah, we run already a bit out of the time, but I would suggest if you are all right with it, that we will continue until eight o'clock so that we have some space for question and discussion. Yeah, so, it's fine yeah. for me. Unless I would ask something about um, transportation and um, because you also talked about the aircraft and you showed us that a lot of tourists are coming from India and China. Do they come by plane or is it also possible to travel with other means? Because I think even though they try to make the aircrafts more sustainable or more like uh, CO2 neutral, it's still <laughs> one of the most, uh, uh, yeah the baddest uh, like transportation, uh, means of transportation. Yeah. yeah, actually when we talk about the tourists from the India, uh, it's most of them would uh, come by transport, by the land transport because because of the very uh, open border and close. And also the people who come from India, they would like uh, visit the touristic places like Pokhara, Kathmandu, or around these areas. Of course, there are also people who go to the trekking into the mountains. But uh, it's easier for most of the Indian travelers to come also by the transport. Yeah, I would say that. But when you talk in general, in the whole number of the tourists, the huge number usually come from, from the um, air transport. Yes. And is there any um, like critical uh, or does the, the state say something against this uh, use of transportation or is it more uh, or is there some, um, how you say, um, strategies to work for getting the people uh, more by the road than by plane? Uh, you, uh, is your question uh, more about like uh, in terms of tourism or like in terms like, transport, which are more eco-friendly, like that. Yeah, it's about what is the government also doing so that um, maybe the the um, transportation or the traveling from outside into Nepal gets more eco-friendly. Hmm. Uh, actually, uh, recently, uh, I mean, not in this present government, but the previous and some other. Uh, leaders, they were always uh, stressing on like uh, electric vehicles, uh, like mm, bringing more electric uh, cars or even the public transport, which are more eco-friendly, like uh, produced from the electricity. So that is the one thing that the government uh, had mentioned earlier. But uh, when we see the see the like uh, the financial or the budget that the government is allocating. But this time, kind of things, there is very little area that we can be convinced that they are really serious on this matter. Because the recent uh, uh, 
uh, minister in the, in the uh, economics, uh, they were increasing the taxes on the uh, electric vehicle. So which is not like uh, they are not uh, promoting the electric vehicle that shows that people, uh, when it's more expensive, where more taxes, then of course people would go for the cheaper option. But in this case, yeah, government seems like they are interested, but from their actions, it does not make sense. You were you were mentioning the SPCC, uh, Sagamata Pollution Control uh, Committee. Um, uh, we worked with them um, starting in a project in 2011, mm -hmm. in 2013, and uh, we laid the founding stones for for this um, new, um, how to say, um, consciousness about uh, the uh, uh, waste management and more. Uh, a sustainable operation of tourism in in the in the Kumbu region. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing they're doing quite well. And yeah. as one of the questions was how they are financed in the in the chat room, I found that. Uh, so the uh, the so called icefall doctors, mm -hmm. the shepherds who are uh, installing the the fixed rope on on the icefall on on Mount Everest, mm -hmm. get a a kind of nice payment from their clients. Mm -hmm. And part of it is given uh, to SPCC. Yeah. And there is also funding from, from the state and from the national park uh, management. And there is some intransparent share that comes from the, the royalties, uh, mm -hmm. from the, 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 the peak permits that also goes to the management of the national park. But nobody knows, uh, at least we could not find out over the years, how big this share was that goes to the to the local uh, management of the national park. It is, it's the channel through the Department of National Parks, which mm -hmm. is part of the uh, environmental uh, ministry. Uh, there are quite a, a number of problems with tourism in Nepal in, in terms of sustainability and for the uh, for the uh, foreign foreigner from the western part of the world but also from from asia and from most probably from everywhere it's hardly possible to find out which of the regions has a solid um, sustainable um, management of tourism or which trekking agency mm -hmm. following sustainability guidelines or so it's rather rather difficult and as far as as i know and i have an experience in this country for more than 40 years already mm -hmm. there are some European organizations, two operators or um, uh, travel agencies uh, in Austria, in Germany, in Switzerland, who are doing business with uh, a number of tracking agencies of whom they know that they are following these guidelines. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, I think on, the, on the local level, all this knowledge has been delivered from outside to the country. Mm -hmm. For instance, Equimal has organized the first conference on sustainability on mountain tourism in mm -hmm. 1996, and we mm -hmm. published that in a book that came out came out two years later. Um, unfortunately, we did not have uh, funding for implementing a, a larger number of projects, uh, but we had one big tourism project uh, that was in the Rolvaling region. Uh, mm -hmm. Gauri Shankar uh, area and uh, starting from Dolaka district uh, yeah. over the, the range to the, um, uh, to the area where uh, the, the Aniko highway is going to, uh, to the Tibetan border. Yeah. We, it's, a, it's a big area, of course, and uh, we were also asked if we would be able or willing to take over the, con the, the management of the conservation area. But the uh -huh. Russian government was not willing to do that. So Equimal, uh, by its own funding, was not uh, in a <laughs> position to do that. But uh, okay. I, think, I think we have, we have done uh, several important steps for a more sustainable uh, development in that region. Um, as we work together with a number of local groups. And I think in, in your presentation, Uh, you forgot to mention the enormous number of development projects dealing yes, with yes. sort of uh, tourism activities, but not just tourism, also uh, implementing a more sustainable thinking. There are numbers, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of trainings. Yeah. I, of I agree on that. International and also of, of uh, national 
NGOs who are working in the remote areas and, and even in Kathmandu. Uh, perhaps uh, you know this uh, KEEP, uh, Kathmandu yeah. Environment I, Education Project and mm -hmm. so forth. So there are a big number of people doing that and, and they are quite ambitious and they I think that they, they push the, the cart forward. Mm -hmm. But it's rather difficult uh, to to uh, have a, a, an, a visible uh, progress in that sense, as yeah. you know how this country is managed. I mean, yeah. we, we had a, a civil war going on for 10 years and you have fraud and you have everything that is very typical for yes. an underdeveloped country. Yes. And in spite of this, there are these um, nice and really, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, quite well uh, managed uh, projects like the Annapurna Conservation Area yeah. Project or the Kanchenchenga Conservation Area Project. Even the Kumbu and the Everest uh, Project is, uh, to some extent, also a kind of uh, participating and, and local driven project. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gaurishanka Conservation Area, there is not much to write home about. So there is no much funding and nothing is going on at the moment. And mm -hmm. there are constantly uh, catastrophes in this country. There is every year torrential rain washing away hundreds of acres of fields, etc., etc. So the Nepali are really uh, uh, people that suffer from a lot of disadvantages. And in spite of this, there are so many, let's say, um, positive things. <laughs> more than positive. I mean, yeah. the, the Nepal is really rich in in all these cultural things in nature. It's a it's a it's a paradise bird, so to speak, in in the in the Asian world. Yeah, and, uh, I have been to several um, tourism fairs uh, in Asia, and compared to many other Asian countries, Nepal's tourism um, industry is even more aware of that problem and has yeah. more senses of sustainability than all True. the other, Agreed. which is quite surprising from what <laughs> I say. Agree. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Luger, for your remarks. Anyways, I totally agree with what you have said. You can find everything what I have said in more detail on Ecomal's website. So we mm -hmm. have we have uh, next year we're celebrating the 30th anniversary of our collaboration Alps Himalaya mm -hmm. project and so on. So um, I see uh, maybe to build a more uh, uh, thorough insight uh, or also an overview of how sustainable tourism is possible in Nepal would be a good uh, project you now for. Uh, travelers in future also and mm -hmm. also to provide it in many languages I think would be would make sense no thank you very much um, both of you and especially you know that you prepared such a great overview and also that you um, give us some hints how to um, deal with the topic uh, and yeah I hope very much that um, yeah Nepal goes into the right direction and I think you will be also a good um, uh, person of personality in this uh, process and I wish you good luck for your future and um, yeah <laughs> yeah all the thank best thank you thank you so much uh, Maya and thank you everyone for joining this event uh, today I hope it was a bit of information and interesting to you <laughs> and hope to I wish you all a uh, good evening it's a bit late and stay healthy stay safe that's all I can say. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.